Hello, 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 guys, and welcome back to uh, Joe's Ventures. And today we're doing part 63 of our Jurassic World Evolution 2 mod spotlights. We take a look at some of the wonderful mods I've been making and compare them to their real life fossil counterparts. So today we've got a very interesting assortment of mods. We've got a lot of uh, pre Paleozoic stuff, so a lot of Paleozoic stuff that's going to be awesome. And a few dinosaurs. Uh, really interesting assortment and we're going to be starting off with a little titanosaur this is done by luca who's made a wonderful return to modding we have got yamanosaurus or the yamana lizard so let's take a look at these guys There's these two little goobers with their really wonderful colors. So let's take a wonderful little picture or have a look good look. So this is Yamanosaurus, which is means Yamana lizard. The scientific name is Yamanosaurus longinus, was described back in Longinensis or something like that. Described back in 2019. So these guys are an extinct genus of saltosaurine titanosaur. So a titanosaur is with the things like Argentinosaurus, uh, Pagonotitan, uh, Alamosaurus, those animals. But Dreadnoughtus as well. But the saltosaurines were another group. They were kind of smaller. That includes animals, of course, like Saltosaurus. But these guys are relatively live well. These guys are from the Rio Plalas formation in Ecuador. So it's one of the first, I think it's the first non-avian dinosaur actually described from Ecuador, which is quite interesting. And dates back to right at the uh, end of the Cretaceous, around the Maastrichtian, so about 66.9 million years ago. So very likely that these guys would have seen the extinction, you know, the big meteor coming in. So these guys would have been around right at the extinction of all the non-avian dinosaurs. And the holotype itself is contains fragments of a humerus, ulna, tibia, two sacral vertebrae, and a single caudal vertebrae, which was discovered in 2017 and then described in 2019. And yeah, look at that wonderful anatomy. It does fit, of course, uh, with its relatives. Of course, it's not that well described, but we know kind of a general titanosaur anatomy, which I quite like. Saltosaur's got this kind of shorter neck. All those osteoderms on the back, like that long tail, and the correct feet. How can you not love when we get the correct feet? So, really, really cool one. Uh, Luca always does a wonderful job. I reckon Luca's one of the better modders. And we'll see a lot more of Luca's stuff later in this episode, which I'm really excited to take a look at. So, yeah, I'm going to let you run off and do your thing. Little cuties. Just make sure you get out of the way. So you do okay so next up we've got another really cool one this is by master dude of course uh, making some wonderful mods we've got hi hypsler beamer if you say that so this is hypsa beamer we say that hips hipsy belma or beamer I'll say Hypsobelma from now on. Hypsobelma is a extinct genus of Hadrosaurid dinosaur. So these guys are from... Oh, let have a look at these guys in the nice view there. So these guys are from the Lake Cretaceous around the Companion. Uh, found in the Black Creek group in North Carolina. And there is two, there's one species, uh, Cassicoldia. But then another one may be Missouriensis, which is quite interesting. So the type species was discovered by Edward Drinker Cope, who found it in the Sampson County of North Carolina in 1869. And it's derived from the Greek word high step. So it's Cope believed to have walked quite erect with its toes. It's quite interesting. And the specific name is a flat tail. So it's got high step with a fat uh, with a fat tail. And in Latin, that's what it means. And it wanted to describe from a caudal vertebrae, some from more fragments and some other small fragments. All found in 1869 by state professor Washington Carthus Kerr in the black group. And then a second water vertebrae was referred to it and things like that. And uh, they actually noted, uh, it was like, oh, it might actually, the femoral fragments may actually be Tyrannosaurus and Dryptosaurus. And then the caudal vertebrae were um, 
called the lectotype, which is quite interesting. And then the second species was initially placed in the genus Parasaurus in 1945, was considered uh, Hepsibema or H. Missouriensis by Jack Horner and Donald uh, Bard in 1979. And since there's been the official state fossil of Missouri, which is quite interesting, though it is continued considered dubious in both editions of Dinosauria, and considers and a lot of people still consider Parasaurus uh, valid uh, and distinct from Hypsobema based on new discoveries. So that's quite interesting, though. Yeah, another really really cool guy, uh, not known from too much, but a really interesting rendition. I really like how uh, Master Dudes kind of gave it like those big brow ridges and. All that really interesting design. I quite like it. Very, very cool. I like all these colors he does. He does quite well. You get like a mix of your kind of more basic brown ones, which I like, and then you get the occasional flashy one, which is always really cool. So, yeah, we're going to let you run off and do your thing. Next up, we have got uh, two species of Admontosaurus. So, we're going to talk about the species differences. So, next up, we've got uh, first up, we're going to go with the earliest one. So, we've got uh, by Case of Cog and Net Raptor, we have got uh, Emontosaurus regalis. So here we've got Edmontosaurus. So Edmontosaurus, and why are you doing that? Why is it not being fixed yet? Let's look at uh, which one should we have a look at? Well, look at you. You've got a nice pose. So this is Edmontosaurus regalis. So this is a species of hadrosaurid dinosaur, very similar to an actens as we get into. Uh, e. regalis is typically known from Western North America that date back to the late Carpanian of the Cretaceous about 73 million years ago, but may have potentially lived up into the uh, Mastrictian, early Mastrictian. So Edmontosaurus regalis is actually quite well known um, and is actually known from several fossils, uh, including some preserved uh, uh, mummies as well, so it's quite cool. And they were among the largest of the hadrosaurs with a large a full-grown adult, adult potentially being up to like 9 meters or 30 feet long with some larger specimens being up to 12 meters or 13 as well though a neck dens was a little bit bigger and the type specimen of every gallus is estimated to be about 9 to 12 meters and uh 22 species uh 2022 studies suggest that regalus may have been heavier than a neck dens but um they may have not been very much different uh, but typically kind of be considered a, a neck dance to be a little bit bigger but um one of the main differences between uh regalis and a neck dance is not really size it's typically more their skull shape these guys have a little bit more of a kind of pushed in skull that's a little bit not quite as wide as a neck dance and they also have as you can see that triangular skull and also that uh one specimen also preserves that kind of soft tissue comb or wattle on the top of its head but are very similar to uh, Anectens and other adrosaurs. It's got lots of little teeth and large beak and all that. So it's not that different. Um, it was first described as Trachodon carvanus and by Edward Drinker Cope. So it's got a lot of taxonomic history. But it was originally considered Trachodon and then Edmontosaurus. And then uh, Anatosaurus was lumped into Edmontosaurus, for example. So it's very much a complicated history. I'm not going to get too much into that. But as I mentioned, these guys are in the group uh, Edmontosaurini, which includes uh, Anectens, uh, Cudosaurus, and Kerbosaurus. And there's been a lot of research into their paleobiology. So these guys, um, with Edmontosaurus and Anectens, they used to classify... There were lots of features that were pre previously used in Anectens, uh, not Anectens, in Regalos, to kind of find different species. But turns out there's a lot of variations, so a lot of them have been kind of lumped into Rugalis, and then uh, and then Anectens as well, which is sort of the kind of later species. There's also some uh, preserved uh, Ramphotheca or beak. So it shows that the beak of a Montosaurus was actually much more hook shaped there, and not there's like a duck bill, and much more extensive as well. And there's also a study that actually uh, proposed that 
E. regalis would have reached maturity at about 10 to 15 years of age. So it's so it's a, probably a little bit of a longer lived animal as well. And uh, there has been like, as I mentioned, the taxonomic history. Uh, there was one specimen that's found skull. They're quite well preserved and they've been found in bone beds. So there's been vo bone beds of E. regalis and other hadrosaurs have been used to suggest that these guys were gregarious or living in herds. And there's two quarries that have uh, quite large uh, bone beds with Edmontosaurus and uh, Regalis that include uh, Pince Creek Formation and the Horseshoe Canyon Formation. So paleoecology, these guys are defined by the first appearance of the Edmontian land vertebrate age is where we get the first Edmontosaurus Regalis. And though they're sometimes reported to be early uh, mistricted in the Horseshoe Canyon Formation is about from 73 million years ago into the Companion and ended about 68 to 67 million years ago and is found in the lowest of them all and these guys also had a wide distribution they lived from pretty much alaska down into the americas and they and into colorado and it's believed they potentially may have migrated uh but um such a trip would have actually mean they would have to walk two to ten kilometers per hour uh, which is interesting and could be brought from alaska and it actually contradicts a lot of uh, the possible migratory nature of a lot of other dinosaurs which most likely would have overwintered, so that's something that they could have uh, done. But then uh, another study came out that suggests that the guys would have overwintered and hanged out in um, the colder parts, so up in Alaska during the winter. And as we mentioned, there's a very interesting formation, the Horseshoe Formation and all of those formations. They would have lived with all sorts of different animals. Uh, America at the time was still divided by the West Interior Seaway. So they would have lived uh, pretty much around that time, uh, around that place, the shallow sea in the middle of the thing. So they would have got around too much. But they lived with dinosaurs such as Montanus uh, ceratops, Pachyrhinosaurus, Yopocephalus, Edmontonia, Ornithomimus, and uh, Struthiomimus, also Saurolophus, Parkosaurus, all sorts of uh, really interesting dinosaurs. Also Displetosaurus, Albertosaurus, lots of Truodontids and Dromaeosaurs. And those kind of animals. So it's kind of the first ones before we get to Regalus. But yeah, main differences is the skull and the comb and the age. These guys are a little bit older, living in the Campanian, maybe early Mistrictian, and got a pretty nice little fleshy comb going on there. So yeah, really, really cool. So that's our first species. So next up is going to be all about Anectens. So this is the one that lived with our favorite big bad T-Rex. So let's uh, open up. Okay, let's have a look at you since you're walking on the side like that. Let's have a look at you. You're, you're like perfectly positioned. Okay, there we are. So this is E. anectens, also means means the connected lizard from Edmonton, or, or sometimes known as a natosaurus or duck lizard. Uh, these guys are a species uh, very closely related, as I mentioned, and uh, regalis. These are a hadrosaur a dinosaur from the late Mistrictian and the very end of the Cretaceous, which from now Western North America. So these guys have a very complicated taxonomic history. They were described as many different genuses. If you heard the dinosaur Trachodon, or Hadrosaurus, or Natotitan, or Natosaurus, these were all it's still spinning. Oh my gosh, why has it got to do that to me? Anyway, but yeah, if you've a Natotitan and walking with dinosaurs was uh, a neck dens, which is interesting as well. So it's had a quite a complicated taxonomic history. But it was first discovered as the holotype as dinosaurus or anatotitan in 1882 by um, Edward Trinket Cope and was described then. Then it was originally conceived as like a, a semi-aquatic animal. Uh, but we know it would have lived with T-Rex as well at that time as well. And there's been all sorts of different discoveries and things like that. And even now we've actually found some preserved... Uh, preserved mummies as well as much much like for regalis we've got uh, preserved mummies of anectens that show that didn't have the comb and it actually had two nails uh, very similar to like hoofs on uh, ungulates today's which is quite interesting so there has been quite a complicated taxonomic history so the skull on uh, skeleton of anectens is also well known and they probably got up to about uh, 12 meters long 
and some have been estimated to be even bigger than that. There are some specimens that may have had like uh, even bigger. And even like 15 meters, nearly 10 metric tons, which would pretty much uh, put it on par with its relative Shatungosaurus in Asia, which is considered the largest hadrosaur. But these guys could have potentially got about the same size. But these are sometimes considered overestimates, and they would likely have not been average individuals. And most specimens that we find are actually quite small. And uh, kind of the most well known skeletons are about uh, 8 to 9 meters long. But there could have been some giant individuals as well, which is quite interesting. And another thing that sets it apart from a nectins has got that quite wide snout. You can see much wider snout. It looks almost like a goose, uh, things like that. And they've also got preserved Brancifica as well, which is the covering of the uh, the keratin covering of the beak, which shows that they have quite big beaks as well. And um, they also have a much more rectangular skull, as you can kind of see there, much more rectangular. These guys are a bit more triangular, a uh, lot wider, things like that. In terms of classification, as I mentioned, it was originally considered historically as an Adosaurus and then lumped with an uh, into uh, Edmontosaurus, uh, which was back in 1942, I believe. And yeah, that really helps with, I think, a lot of um, taxonomy, a lot of good lumping, because they are quite similar to each other. And in terms of paleobiology, these guys would have been large herbivores, very similar to Regalis, feeding around the uh, ecosystem, being big herbivores and all that. And there's been some research on growth as well. As we mentioned, there's, uh, these guys have actually grown a little bit faster than uh, Rugalus. Uh, these, these guys potentially kind of reach maturity about nine years of age based on various specimens. And that seems to be similar to other hadrosaurs. And um, there's also some uh, other species that are believed to be just juveniles of this guy. So a lot of the species, different species of, of Montosaurus, they're originally described as their own genus and species were just juvenile or gross stages of either Regalus or Nectin. So a lot of lumping has happened, and now we have a pretty good idea of uh, these guys, which is really cool. But in terms of paleoecology, uh, these guys are really only known from the latest uh, uh, Maastrichtian. So they found in the Hell Creek and Lance formations in South Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, and the Frenchman formation in Saskatchewan. So around like North America, uh, North America around Canada and uh kind of the Midwest, you could say. So the Lancian time was, this was basically the time before the big extinction. And um, Edmontosaurus was one of the most common dinosaurs at that time and actually make up one seventh of the large dinosaurs sampled, which is the rest, the rest being Triceratops. So these guys would have lived with a lot of animals we all know and love, things like Vesculosaurus, Taurosaurus, Ankylosaurus, Pachycephalosaurus, Ornithomimus, Pectinodon, Archaeoraptor, Dakotaraptor, uh, and Tyrannosaurus rex. So all of those big famous ones that we all know and love. With the uh, Hal Creek formation being actually, if you've seen Saurian, you get a good idea. It's kind of wet formation right next to the uh, Western Ontario Seaway that was drying out at the time. There would have been all sorts of different conifer trees and cypress trees and ginkgos and all that. Also lots of different types of small animals such as turtles and monitor lizards as well which is quite interesting. And the Lance Formation is a little bit more south. They look more like a bayou around Louisiana with palm trees and oaks and all that and lots of freshwater fish. So yeah, very interesting animal. And they found the two mummies of Edmontus, uh, Ian Ectans were found in uh, the Lance Formation. So that helps us give a pretty good idea of what these guys looked like. But yeah, really, really cool. Really, really awesome. So yeah, that was again done by Casey Cog and Netraptor. So really great job giving us these two species and i love how they come out i love the differences i like i especially like this one i like this uh, pattern on this one in comparison it really makes them distinct really really cool okay so we'll let you run off and do your thing of course so next up we've got another mod by master dude so we're heading back into the paleozoic with lots of really cool aquatic animals so now we have got sarcoprion so sarcoprion i'll get into is a very interesting animal Let me get out, get out of the shadow for a bit. There we are. We'll have a look at you then. Oh, well, we can have a look at this one. This one looks a little nicer angle. So, Sacroprion. 
Sarcoprion, as you could kind of guess, is a close relative of Halicoprion. So these guys, which means Sarcoprion means flesh saw in ancient Greek, is an extinct species of shark-like uh, eugenodont hominocephalids. So they're related to ratfish and modern chimeras. And um, very close relative of the larger Halicoprion. So these guys, would, as you can see, have a similar world to these guys and would have their teeth in the lower jaw as well. And only one species is known, which is Sacrion edax, which is, comes from Germany. I mean, Greenland, I mean, not Germany. So these guys uh, were adorned, as you can see, uh, adorned with a jaw and mouth structure allowed them to be more hydrodynamic than other members of this family, which is quite interesting. And the tooth whorl was actually smaller, and its rostrum was much longer than its relatives, such as Helicoprion and Edestus. And these guys would actually be very similar in ecology, potentially to like a modern shortfin mako, and probably much more adapted for feeding on fast-moving prey, which is quite interesting. And in addition to that, they were probably about six meters long in life, which is quite similar to obviously a living great white shark, and uh, been been quite interesting. So in terms of paleoecology, even though it's uh, adaptions are quite speculative, these guys would have probably hunted by thrashing at its prey with its lower tooth will, believed to be much like how a dentist would have hunted. Or if not, it may, like Helicoprion, may have actually used its actually teeth to cut and feed prey back into its throat. And it could have potentially done both. Uh, the tooth wheels seem to be a very successful thing in the Paleozoic for this group and seem to have done well. You can see the main difference, that tooth wheel is kind of not the only teeth. You can see some teeth at the top there as well. So yeah, another very interesting uh, animal here. And you can see a master dude painted the gills on and everything. But it was missing, I think, a few of its... Uh, was yeah it didn't really need these guys um, little clasps and things like that but yeah really really cool definitely a big fan so Saka Prion really starting off the Paleozoic stuff strong but next up this is a pack that I've actually been really excited for for a little while uh, Luca made this and it's really really awesome it's the Devonian Predators pack so this is a pack that includes three different animals that we'll go into that uh, are from the Devonian, like, along with Dunkley Osteus, so he doesn't feel so alone. We've got quite a few different uh, animals in this one. So we're going to be starting off with a uh, very interesting shark as well to go with Saka Prime. We've got Cetacanthus. So, very interesting guy. Let's see if we can get one. We'll have a look at you since you are not so covered in shadow anymore. So this is Cetacanthus. So these guys are often known from their weird little spine. And being a type of uh, shark, these guys are mostly are cartilaginous fish. So very hard to preserve them. But these guys are known a lot from their spines that they have down in the, their fins here. Uh, which is quite interesting. And also known from teeth and things like that. So... In terms of its uh, description, these guys, uh, this fossil spine as well, it could be like four to seven inches depending on the species. But in terms of their ecology, there's lots of different species, but we don't really know it's kind of a cluster. We really don't know what's going on. But these guys have been found nearly world worldwide across the Devonian through into the Permian. And the long range of spines, mean there may be different genera of sharks as well, but it's neither here nor there, but they're pretty much found all across the world. Uh, and what these guys look like. There have been actually a rare partial fossil found of Cetacanthus that suggests these guys uh, would have had the uh, leathery skin, uh, jaws and teeth and things like that. And it was originally described as Cetacanthus clarki and then as Comprestus. And it's kind of all over the place with the taxonomy. But this is a pretty good idea of what it would look like. And there's a few different species. Uh, but these guys, I believe, would probably most likely be the biggest one, which it's not here. But... A partial skeleton and soft parts, these guys have been found to be living marine sh strata, so have been marine sharks. Uh, based on their relatively small uh, size of spines and body fragments, they're all less likely more than six feet long, so not quite two meters. Uh, and the Ohio body fossil has cladodont teeth, which is, has multiple prongs. So that suggests that these guys were definitely apex predators or uh, definitely meat eaters. With these sharp teeth, it would have been actually really useful for grasping and holding prey. Uh, rather than slicing uh, chunks from larger prey. So these guys would be preying on things that are smaller. And this means their diet must have most likely been small fish, uh, cephalopods, and arthropods, so most of the things like that. And they share these spines, uh, like modern animals, like bullhead sharks and spicy dogfish, uh, 
spiny dogfish sharks, they have these spines, and these are believed to be for protection and may be slightly poisonous. Though Cetacanthus appears to have a spine both on its dorsal fins, this could have been really great uh, protection from larger predators and other sharks, such as um, Dunkleosteus. And they, there wasn't the evidence that these guys would have been poisonous. It still would have been probably a good enough deterrent for a big animal like Dunkleosteus with a big sharp spine like that. But yeah, another really, really cool one. Definitely love this uh, reconstruction of Cetacanthus and really cool to talk about them as well. I really think the Paleozoic is so underrated, so I love talking about it as much as I can. As much as I can. So let's let these guys swim off. Hopefully you don't go in. Are you in front of there? I don't want it to be in front of there. There you are. Okay, so you're gone. Next we've got Burgalestis, I believe you say that. So Burgalestis, another really interesting one. So we'll let you swim out. So we'll pick one that's... Uh, oh, we'll have a look at you. Yeah, I like the colors on you. So this is Burgalestis, another really cool guy. These guys are an extinct genus of uh, Placoderm. So Placoderm is a really interesting group of fish that were around the, in the Devonian. I don't, I don't know if they made it quite to the... I don't think they made it to the... Uh, Permian, but they were around like a lot of the early Paleozoic, which is really really cool So these guys are found from the late Devonian of Ohio and were quite big and uh, Placoderms as a whole these guys were a group of armored fish So typically their head and body were covered in armor, which kind of uh, where they got the name and they were some of the first jawed fish So they were the first some of the first fish to evolve jaws to be able to eat bigger things, which is really really cool and in terms of its ecology, these guys, uh, uh, Burgenas, if you say that, Burgatus, is actually believed to have been uh, Durophagus. So these guys, as you can see, they've got those big jaws uh, that were well adapted for breaking into hard shells. So potentially eating uh, things like orthocones and nautiloids and potentially all sorts of hard foods, maybe even brachiopods like oysters and clams and things like that. Those kind of hard shelled things may have been pretty good prey for these guys, but I mentioned orthocones, uh, nautiloids, a uh, thing, and what else? Uh, the crustaceans would probably be pretty good food for these guys. And we actually do not know that much about this guy, but most recent taxonomy suggests that these guys were in that kind of a group that was coming up to the next animal we'll talk about, Titanic these, which is quite interesting. But yeah, really, really cool animal. Uh, it's been a couple mods have had this guy in, like especially like Mega Aquarium. So it's a really cool animal that I think deserves some attention, and a very cool uh, big, um, big placoderm. I believe they got to about, I think the estimates are like two or three meters long, or maybe up to six meters long. But I doubt uh, those are the kind of estimates on these guys are uh, neither here nor there. But I imagine they would be probably about a couple, uh, two or three meters long. That's kind of what I imagine. Doesn't give me an estimate here, so I'm not too sure. But yeah, really cool placoderms. And this was described by uh, the same guy that described Dunkleosteus, uh, Mr. Dunkel, in 1947. So it's pretty interesting. So yeah, that's uh, Burlestus. Next up, we've got uh, the kind of next biggest placoderm. So really, really cool. We've got Titanoecthes. So we got this wonderful Titanoecthes. So these guys are a really, really large uh, type of placoderm. Comparable in size uh, to Dunkleosteus, which is pretty much the largest placoderm that we know of. Let's have a look at you here. Let's see. Oh, you probably can't get a good angle of you there. I want to get a good view of you in the sun. There we are. Put you there. Oh, we'll have a look at you there. Really, really cool. Oh, that's a nice, that's a nice pose. We'll have a look at you like that. Okay. So Titanic, these these guys were giant marine placoderms, so related to Dunkleosteus and Bolestus. 
These guys are from the late Devonian of Morocco, eastern North America, and potentially Europe. And many of the species uh, approach Dunkleosteus in their size and build, but unlike Dunkleosteus, which was most likely a uh, really big uh, apex predator, these guys were actually filter feeders, and it actually seemed that these guys would have been well adapted. They had very small, ineffective looking mouth plates, and these guys would have probably been most likely filter feeders that would have uh, had large mouths to swallow whole shoals of uh, anchovy or zooplankton whole, which is quite interesting. And then the mouth plates actually retain the prey while allowing water to escape. So it basically would have acted like a filter. And there's been confirmed uh, studies that show that these guys would have been filter feeders very similar to modern baleen whales and basking sharks. Um, and actually professed to be uh, developed from Bethnic Jurophagus uh, animals, very similar to Bogatius, so kind of those kind of animals, and then would have evolved into these kind of huge filter feeding uh suspension feeders like these guys so Burlestis was kind of an early relative on like that midway mark until they became the big filter feeders like titanic these and this actually makes them the first known uh large size so very much the first big filter feeder that lived in uh the our ecosystems which is quite interesting and very very interesting really really cool animals as well so in terms of size they're originally estimated to be about 7 to 7.6 meters, or 23 to 25 feet. Uh, similar in size to other estimates of Dunkleosteus. But more recently, uh, Elgman in 2023 actually suggests that they were incomparable in size to Dunkleosteus, but being just over 4 meters long, which is still huge, uh, and would have still made it uh, up there with Dunkleosteus, which was estimated to be about that same size. But um, that's just more recent evidence that I, I mean, there has been some controversy about that. But I'd go with the most recent one for now. So these guys, as I mentioned, are related to Burgalestis and Tophelnecthes. Uh, so they're own kind of own group of uh, placoderms. And there's been a few species described. There's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. This species, I believe, is meant to be Clarkeye because it's kind of the largest one known. So these guys come from the Cleveland Shale, so this is the same type that kind of lives with um, Dunkleosteus and stuff like that in Ohio, and this is very likely that it's kind of same size. But there's a few different species and have different uh, estimated sizes, but the largest one I believe is T. Kalaki, uh, which is really, really cool. And another really, really cool f uh, fish, I love talking about these fish. It's really nice to get some Paleozoic animals for a change. The Paleozoic, is, as I mentioned, is so underrated. But yeah, really awesome mods done by Luca. Really like top tier quality in my opinion. Always did a wonderful job. Let's have a look at these guys. They look really, really wonderful. Did a wonderful job. Okay, so that's it in terms of these guys. And that's a good second to last animal. So last but certainly not least, we've got a really interesting Spinosaur. Uh, a really interesting animal. We've got Cymosaurus. So this is a very interesting dinosaur, only known from teeth. I'll have a look at, I'll have a look at you, because you're standing in a nice pose. So, Cymosaurus has been Cymolizard. These are a genus of Spinosaurid dinosaur, related to Baryonyx, Spinosaurus, all that. Found in China and Thailand during the early Cretaceous, so the Baptian to Alpian, which actually makes it the first recorded Spinosaur from Asia, and is confidently known only from tooth remains, were being first found in the Shaokuna Formation and then in the younger Kilokarat Formation. And the only species known is Spinosaurus tunetheon, which is uh, honors the Thai paleontologist Varna Stinthorn, which was uh, first described in 1986. Then in 2009, four teeth of these guys were actually described as a, a pliosaur uh, under the species uh, Spinophosaurus frugulins, so then identified with those of Spinosaurid, then possibly uh, Cymosaurus, but has yet to be determined where these two partial Spinosaurus skeletons uh, from Thailand are isolated from, and an isolated tooth of Japan also belong to Cymosaurus. So we really don't know much about the history of, uh, oh, be there. oh, it's still moving. Of course it doesn't. This is really annoying. But anyway, have a look at you. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so based on its teeth, we don't know much about its size, but we know what it's probably about five to nine meters long, or about 17 to 30 feet. With the holotype's tooth being about 62.5 uh, centimeters, it's really only known from teeth. 
it's straight and conical and very similar to baryonyx in terms of its anatomy and um, as a spinosaur it would really have that long snout robust forelimbs uh, potentially a tails uh, a tails a tall sail down its back and it's actually been considered a dubious name by a lot of paleontologists some arguing it can't can't even differentiate it from other early cretaceous spinosaurids and it made it to be not be a dinosaur at all uh, it was originally described as an unknown crocodile uh, which is quite interesting and there's a lot known about it there's been all sorts of different remains potentially found of spinosaurids that have all been kind of thrown into cymosaurus but we don't really know if it's truly cymosaurus or not but as i mentioned tentative size estimates is probably about eight to like four meters as well the smaller one's probably about five meters uh long and the type species they're all this is the tooth taxa so they're really only known from teeth and maybe some other isolated remains that they could be potentially something else uh, some proscrania found may have been attributed to the genus, but we really don't know. And actually, Jadessa may have actually been similar to uh, Ichthyo venator, which is most likely because that's also from uh, Asia. And uh, even similar to like Suchomimus, which is in Africa, so very sim similar animals like that. In terms of classification, as I mentioned, it's been quite a taxonomic uh, run around. It was originally described as a type of crocodile. And some people don't, still believe don't believe that it's actually a uh, spinosaurid. Some believe it's actually a crocodile, crocodile still, or a plesiosaur, or an ichthyosaur, and it's still considered quite dubious. But in terms of spinosaurids, it's quite basal to the spinosaurine group. So it's the early ancestors, the relatives such as um, Ichthyovenata and Oxalania, and then eventually Spinosaurus. And it kind of still fits in those new discoveries, things like that. There has been some uh, questions about the validity of Cymosaurus or whether it is a Spinosaurus in general. So it's very, very interesting in that regard. In terms of its biology, uh, diet and feeding, it probably was a heavily piscivorous, very similar to other uh, Spinosaurus. So eating a lot of uh, fish and potentially eating a lot like gharials. So eating a lot of fish, but also potentially just any animal really. Uh, there's been a lot of research into its uh, habits, in terms of aquatic habits. And it's actually uh, compared the oxygen isotopes in these uh, teeth compared to theropod and sauropod dinosaurs. And these show that Cymosaurus actually has closer isotope ratios to freshwater turtles and crocodilians than other theropods. So these guys would have most likely spend most, uh, most or part of their day, uh, much of its daily life near the water. So that's quite interesting. And um, it also suggests that these guys may have uh, lived with other guys been niche partitioning all that and in terms of its formation living in northern thailand uh northeastern thailand it's a formation lived with it's not really too much known and it's as i mentioned it has been need to be found in japan and some other remains it's complicated taxonomy but these guys would have lived with a few different dinosaurs such as the metricanthosaurus simotyrannus uh, some megaraptorans salurosaurs with names that i probably can't pronounce some sauropods uh all sorts of different types of fish that it would have been feeding on, uh, some uh, crocodilians, uh, things like that, some pterosaurs as well, iguanodontians as well in the other formation. So very interesting animal. And it may be different species as well, all that. Uh, taxonomy is very complicated with this guy. Uh, if you uh, want to know more about it, I just, I just can't go through all that in one video. It's quite complicated uh, and probably be sitting here for like, uh, 20 minutes talking about all that, but yeah, really, really cool. Uh, Cymosaurus, uh, Cymosaurus, did you say that? Yeah, Cymosaurus. Really, really cool guy. Interesting taxonomy, and yeah, really nice mod. I think Master Duke really did a great job with this guy. So, yeah, I think this is a great place to end the video. So, this is a really fun one. I like talking about all the Paleozoic stuff and all the complicated stuff about Cymosaurus, very interesting. So um, yeah, I uh, really, really, really hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to get the little bell icon to get notified of anything. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe, and bye.